announcement. Um, there are some folks that aren't feeling well that aren't here that are watching live. And I wanted to make sure that they were in on the announcement. Next Sunday, because we we stopped doing first Sunday dinners together. So uh, we're going to do second Sunday dinner starting next week. <laughs> so, because, I mean, with COVID and everything, everybody kind of got away from it. And the Lord is telling me through several ways it's time to get back. So, okay. All right. We are going to start today in the book of Amos. You need to find your table of contents. That's okay. I did. When we say that we know that the time is coming for the Lord's return, we need to first keep in mind what that means. What happens at the rapture of the body of Christ? What happens during the great tribulation? God is going to judge. The Lord is directing us to the book of Amos to show us, okay, his righteous judgments and the reason why. But he has hidden a mystery in the first part of the book of Amos that most people never see. So, a little bit of a story here. After I had finished studying and putting the message of the Lord's order that he wanted, I received a confirmation about the message because... Darlene can tell you I've really been struggling with preaching this message. Because it's one of those messages that's not fuzzy, doesn't make you feel good, and the Lord is going to go directly at your heart. Okay? Yesterday in my quiet time, I entered a time of prayer. And the Lord gave me, I'm just what I'm going to call a vision. I was in the wilderness, and the Lord was with me. And He said to me, Come. I want to show you something. So we walked, but only a short way, but we walked towards the horizon. What do you see? He asked. As I looked, the sky was dark, but the horizon had light. It was the light of the sun, yet the sun had not risen yet. It was the time of pre-dawn. Then I said, I see light coming. The Lord said, yes, before the sun rises, you know its time is near because you see the signs of its coming. You have been shown through the word of God, through your readings, the Lord is coming. Judgment is coming because I am showing you the light before the dawn. It was then that the Lord revealed to me the circuit of the sun. From dawn until midday, the heat of the sun is somewhat minimal, almost peaceful. Yet from noon time on, the, heats, the sun of the heat intensifies, and it can literally be stifling. This, I was shown, was a picture of the coming tribulation. The first half, relative peace, but the second half, intense fire, or judgment. It was then that the Lord said this to me. You have been shown these things to prepare the way and warn the people. Go on speaking and do not be silent. It's not just a phrase. It is a command. And it is. I checked. He looked back at the horizon and he said... The time is near. Share the vision. So now I know why Amos 1.1. So in Amos 1.1, we need to begin there. And as we look at Amos, remember what I say about any Old Testament book. You need to pay attention to the names. You're going to see your first page is like relatively blank until you turn over to the back side. So what we're going to do is I want to show you God's message in the very beginning of Amos. Okay? <laughs> The words of Amos, who was among the sheep herders from Tekoa. Let's just stop there. The word Amos literally means burden. Okay? There is a burden. He is also a sheep herder. Sheep herder, this is the Hebrew word nofeth, 
which means a breeder or a tender of sheep. So now get the picture first. Now listen to me. The Lord is going to lay out a beautiful picture here. From just from just from this first sentence alone. Alright? So he's a sheep herder, but he's from Tekoa. Well, what does Tekoa mean? Tekoa means a stockade or a penned in fence. Here we have a burden of a shepherd, and the message is penned in. Just listen. Jeremiah 20, verse 9. But if I say I will not remember him or speak anymore in his name, then in my heart it becomes like a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I am weary of holding it in, and I cannot endure it. What you're seeing is a picture. You're seeing a picture of a message. A message of a shepherd that has a burden. And the message is penned in. What is the message? Judgment is coming. Now listen to me. This message is a burden. But none of my... None of my peers want to preach it. When he laid this on my heart, now listen to me, we're going to talk about some pretty nasty stuff that people did. And we're going to see a picture, we're literally going to see a picture of humanity. Okay? But I want you to hold on until the end. Because it is in the end that all of this comes together. You will literally see the heart of God when it comes to this judgment. Now, I want you to look at verse 2 in Amos. And I want you to see something. Because it's going to come up over and over again the whole entire time that we're here this morning. Okay? Look at the beginning of verse number... No, well, that's... What? Verse 2. Not verse 3. Verse 2. And he said, The Lord roars from Zion, and from Jerusalem he utters his voice. And the shepherds pasture grounds mourn, and the summit of Carmel dries up. Now, there's a couple of things here. Number one. I'm going to have to change that screen. Number one, this is an indication that God's word is of intense heat. The focus of these verses is that God is speaking loudly. The Lord roars. The results of his speaking make the ground mourn and the snow caps, the summit, dry up. This is an indication that God's word is of intense heat. Now, listen to me. When you think of intense heat, when you think of that, I want you to think of the color red. Everybody write that down somewhere. Think of the color red, because it's going to come into play later on. God is saying in no uncertain terms that judgment is about to come upon the earth from the tops of the mountains to the valleys of the pastures, and that no nation and no people will be spared, save those who are called up through the rapture. Yet even we will be judged. Yes? Yes. This is a call to pay attention to what the Lord is saying. Think about it. You're in the wilderness. Okay? You're all by yourself. And then from behind you, you hear the loud roar of a lion. How do you react? Ah! It's just a lion. Or you... Oh! What is that? Alright, so he's trying to get your attention. Now, in the next two chapters, we're going to see a list of eight nations or peoples that God will pronounce judgment upon. Actually, the whole book of Amos is going to cover everybody. Okay? Listen to me. From the evilest of nations to the so-called faithful of Christians. God covers everybody. Okay? And we're going to see that all throughout this book. But let's just look at this first part. Understand that God was indeed speaking to the nations and the people of the day. There's a message for them for that day, okay? And that, that message was fulfilled. But this book is a book of prophecy, and there is a connection to what is happening today. If you don't believe me, just hang on. Now, here we go. For three transgressions and for four. Now, look at verse 3. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Damascus... And for four. Okay? Now look, 
This idea for three of and then for four, it's going to be repeated every single time he talks about a nation. What have we learned about when, whenever God repeats something? Why is he saying that? Now, here's the key that I want you to understand. Whenever God says something, threefold is the most important. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Three, okay? Now, but we're talking about three transgressions. So it's a, it's a picture of transgressions that they've really come to the end, okay? They've done holy, they've done bad, bad, and bad. Bad, worse, and worse, sir, I guess. So the idea is for three transgressions, meaning you've, got, you've come to the line, but for four, they've gone overboard. And now each overboard sin, God is going to call out. Now look what he talks about for Damascus. Let's begin there. I will not revoke its punishment because they threshed Gilead with implements of sharp iron. Now, what we're going to see is, we're going to see that you need to pay attention to the name of the place that God names, and then their reproach. What is it that God is calling out on them? Okay, watch. Their name. The word Damascus literally means silent is the sackcloth weaver. Okay, a sackcloth weaver was somebody who created a garb, and sackcloth was used for anybody? Morning. For mourning. It was a time of mourning. It was a time of, 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 of being sorrowful. Okay? So when the weaver was creating the sackcloth, he would be silent in doing so, knowing that what his work was doing, knowing that what he was about to give to somebody else was literally going to be attached to mourning. Okay? Now, what is their reproach? Their reproach is brutality. Look what it says in verse number three. They threshed Gilead with implements of sharp iron. Now, this is important. They threshed Gilead with implements of sharp iron. The Arameans, okay, who was attacking them at that time, that's who Damascus was, they brutally attacked and threshed the Gileads. Now, the Gileads are a part of the tribe of Gad. Okay, so they're one of the 12 tribes of Israel. The connotation is that the Arameans, the Arameans' brutality was horrifying. Look at the picture. To increase the outcome, sledges with iron spikes were driven through the stalks to increase the efficiency of threshing. God is literally saying, you did that to my people. You took iron spikes and you put them into my people. You were brutal to them. You used implements of iron spikes. The Arameans did the very same thing to the Gideonites. The Gileadites. For what purpose? We want your land. Brutality. That's one. Next, we come to Gaza in verses one or verses six through eight. This is going to be the nation of the Philistines. Okay? Now, we've heard of the Philistines. What does their name mean? Their name means the strong. All right? What is it that they did? Verse number six. I will not revoke its punishment because they deported an entire population to deliver it up to Edom. Oppression. They took an entire population and they oppressed them. Now I want you to see something. They deported an entire population and delivered them up to the Edomites. We'll talk about them in just a minute. But here's the thing, that word deported is the Hebrew word galah, which means to leave. Listen, the connotation here is that the people were in a peaceful arrangement with them. They were in a peaceful arrangement with the Philistines at the time, yet the Philistines turned their back on them and sold them off to the Edomites. They literally had them in a false sense of security, and then they sent them away. What the Edomites, who are descendants of anybody? Remember? Edom. Okay. Huh? Nope. Esau. Esau. So Esau and Edom are the same. Okay, and we'll actually look at that in just a second. All right? Now, the Edomites, descendants of Esau, did with the population, whatever they did, it's not mentioned. 
However, if the Lord is involved, you can guarantee it ain't good. Okay? So that's number two, oppression. Number three, let's look at verse number nine. Thus says the Lord for three transgressions of Tyre and for four. I will not revoke its punishment. What does the word Tyre mean? Tyre means a rock. Where are we going with this? Just hang on. I promise you. What is their reproach? I will not revoke its punishment. Because they delivered up an entire population to eat them. Wait, you just said that. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. The word is completely different. As in verse number... What was it? Verse number 8. The word is deported. Here... The word is something completely different. What did I say? God's tired. Oh. Yeah. Hey. Verse 9. I will not revoke his point because they deliver up. That is the Hebrew word. I should be done it backwards. Imprisoned. Sagar means to imprison. The one before it, deliver, means to it to means something completely different, means to leave. Okay? So there's a completely different connotation. Let me go back. So the reproach against Tyre is imprisonment. The connotation here is that the Phoenicians were connected to Tyre, forcibly took an entire population and then sent them to Edom. What is Edom doing with all these people? It's not mentioned. But I can tell you this. If it's here and the Lord is involved, it ain't good. There you go. I, and you can probably come to your own ideas about what it is. Now, now let's come to the next one. Edom. Okay? All of this is building on top of each other. Look at verse number 11, because now we finally come to Edom. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Edom, and for four, I will not revoke his punishment. Why? Because he pursued his brother with the sword. While he stifled his compassion, his anger also tore continually, and he maintained his fury forever. Now, if you remember of the story of Jacob and Esau, Jacob supplanted Esau and took his birthright. Esau literally gave it away for a pot of soup. Okay? And he understood when he went to his father to receive his blessing that Jacob had gone and taken the blessing from him. Now he was completely out of the luck. Out of luck. So here is Esau who has nothing. But listen, he's the firstborn. He's supposed to have everything. Remember the... the the blessing of the firstborn, you get the kingship of the family, you get the priesthood of the family, and then you get a double portion of the father's land. Okay, Esau threw all of that away. Of course, that has a spiritual connection to us. There's the kingship. This is all the, the, the firstborn, okay? There's the kingship that God wants to give each and every one of us. There is the priesthood, and there is the double portion, okay? Now watch. Edom, his name literally means red. Remember what word I told you to write down earlier, right? What was it? Red. red. And what is red in connotation to? Anger. Anger. Okay? So hang on to that. Now, what is the reproach against Edom? Well, it's pretty obviously clear. Vengeance. When Esau left and when Jacob fleed, the only thing that Esau wanted to do was kill him. Now listen, here's an interesting connotation for you. What the parents do can literally pass down to the children. If the parent is mad and angry all the time, guess how the children are going to act? That's why the Bible says, train up a child in the way they should go, and when they are older, they will not depart from it. If you teach your child anger, if you teach your child brutality, if you teach your child vengeance, if you teach your child, hey, God just wants you to have whatever you want. They will literally live that way because we've taught them that. 
Now, where do we get that idea from? Because we were taught that very same thing. How do you break the curse? He can't. He does. Every time. All you got to do is ask. And he breaks it. It's the craziest thing in the world. Listen, I am the last of my generation. I am the, I am the last Kirby of my generation. I'm it. And the history of my family, we're going a little bit deep, but here we go. So the history of my family is bootleggers. You weren't supposed to fist pump on that one, Roger, but that's okay. So <laughs> the history of my family were bootleggers. Okay? They and now this is up north. They they had moonshine and all their stuff, and they did what they did. And now listen, there were feuds between my family and other families. Things that I didn't know about, I just heard about. But all of that, that alcoholism kept passing down from generation to generation to generation. My grandfather was an alcoholic, died at a very young age. My father was 56 when he died of alcoholism. And it just keeps coming down. But when it got to me, God said, mm -mm, he's mine. And he broke that curse. I didn't do anything. Listen, I got to the point where I was drinking too, drinking heavily. When I was in the military, I had this cabinet, and it had Jack Daniels bottles stacked. You know what I'm talking about. See? So, I had it stacked, and I thought, you know, yeah, this is me, I'm a little drinker. But then God, hope, God got a hold of my heart. He says, that's not who you are. That's not who I called you to be. And it literally took me to see my identity in Christ. And then those chains were broken. You see, there comes a time when God gets you to your end, and He says, enough, child. We're done with this. Now, sometimes we fall backwards, but God's still there going, okay, get it back up. We got this. Bless God, amen. All right, so let's keep going. Remember that Esau was Jacob's brother. Jacob will turn into Israel, right? Therefore, now watch this, watch this. This is important. The wickedness of Esau isn't necessarily against the 12 tribes. Excuse me. It's against God himself. See, most people don't see that. When Esau got vengeful and decided to act out against Israel and attack him at every turn, God saw it as an affront to him. Because God chose Israel. Whew. Next, Amon, verse 13. Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of the sons of Amon, and for four I will not provoke its punishment. What does Amon mean? It means tribal. They were a tribal people. They moved around. Okay, this one's going to get a little, and I apologize, but it's in the Word of God, and we're going. Why is he not going to revoke their punishment? Because they ripped open the pregnant women of Gilead in order to enlarge their borders. Their reproach? Murder of the innocents. Let me put that in today's terminology. Abortion. For what purpose? To enlarge their borders. You kill the kids off, the kids can't grow up, they can't form an army, and they can't overtake you. It's the same thing that the Egyptians did. <coughs> they killed the firstborn of the Israelites. What did God do? He did the same thing. Remember Passover? What did God do? He slayed the firstborn. But did He do it without any mercy? No. If you get underneath that blood, you'll be okay. It doesn't matter who you are. God gave the offer. Some Hebrews, some Jews decided not to listen. And they lost their firstborn. See, God gives the ability to have mercy. Our problem is we don't receive it. <laughs> Even on this side of the cross, God has given us the ability to have mercy. But we decide, I don't need that. I'm good. No, we need God's mercy every moment of every day. We need His grace every moment of every day. So the Amalites wanted to increase their borders. They took the pregnant women of Gilead. They literally killed their unborn children to enlarge their own borders to advance their own agenda. I'm just going to let you sit on that one and you stew over that one for yourself. You 
see where we're going, don't you? Let's go to Moab. Chapter 2, verse 1. For three transgressions of Moab, and for four, I will not revoke its punishment. What does Moab represent? What does it mean? Moab literally means of his father. Okay? Now, if you go back to Moab, if you remember Lot and his two daughters, they decided to sleep with Lot, and the, the tribes of Ammon and Moab come forth from that union, which was incestual. Okay? This is definitely not going to be for kids. So, the whole idea here is you have a whole nation that was brought up because of what the evil that those ladies decided to do, that incest. Okay? Is incestual a word? It is? Yes! Thank you, Jesus. Okay. Now watch. What is their reproach? Because he burned the bones of the king of Edom to lie. Now, at first glance, you're thinking, that's not a big deal. Edom's been a bad guy through this whole thing, right? But read it again. What did they do? They burned the bones. What does that imply? The king of, huh? The king of Edom was already dead. So you know what their reproach is? Cruelty. They literally, chances are, they literally dug up his bones and burned them to nothing. Now, the idea is that the Moabites burned the Edomite king either to death or they dug up his bones and burned them to ash. The latter is probably the case. Either way, they acted, their action was total destruction. If it was the latter, the disturbing of his resting place is more than enough to draw the wrath of God. Listen, there's a point when people die, they get slain in the Bible, but do you rarely ever see once you put them in the ground, dig them up, and then burn their bones. It's not very common. But it happened here. It's their cruelty. <laughs> now we come to Judah. Whew. Judah, that's God's people. They didn't do anything wrong. Verse 4. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Judah, and for four, I will, run, will not revoke his mind. So Judah's in on this too? Mm -hmm. What does Judah mean? Judah means praised. That's literally what the word Judah means, praised. Okay? Ooh, let's get that away. Let's get that now, what is their reproach? You ready? Because they rejected the law of the Lord, and they have not kept his statutes. Their lies also have led them astray. Those after which their fathers walked. Ooh, you know what their reproach is? Defiance. Defiance. Now, I want you to see something interesting, because most people never catch on to this. But when the Lord pointed out to me, I was like, wow, that's kind of amazing. Look at Judah. This is the only nation or people that have committed an offense directly to the Lord. None of the other ones that says, oh, they did it to the Edomite, they did it to this, they did it to that. Here for Judah, and they're the only ones, not even Israel. Judah rejected the law of the Lord. What they did, they did literally against God. These people decided that man's ways were better and truer than God's ways. Can I get a witness? They follow the traditions of men and not the word of God. <coughs> that word rejected is very important. It is the Hebrew word ma'as. And it literally means to reject, refuse, or despise. Now listen to me. This is what the Ju this is what Judah did to the word of God. They rejected it. What you say in the Word of God is not true. They refused it. I'm not living by that. I've got my own ways to do things. Because man has told me, oh, the Bible doesn't mean that. The Bible means this. The Bible means that God just wants me to have whatever I want. 
Sound familiar? They refuse the word of God. And then they despise it. What are you talking about? You know, at the rapture of the body, that the, the Bible itself says that there is a judgment seat for believers. No, there isn't. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 15 say that there are. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 says that there is. Romans chapter 14, verse 10 says there is, there, there is a judgment for believers. Even in Peter it says that judgment will begin with the house of God first. But there are people who walk around and say, eh, I don't believe that. Well, careful. Careful. Ah, there it is. Now, this person. Now, listen, it's Judah, right? Watch this. This person, God's own people, say what I believe is right. And you can't change my mind. Listen, when I was approached with the truth of the kingdom, one of the very first things I said was, this cannot be true. This is just outer what? No, not for a believer. No, it can't be. But then when you study the Word of God, what do you find? It's absolutely true. I'm not making this stuff. No, listen, it's not me. It's him. Okay? This is also indicative of, the, of God's people today who refuse to listen to what God is trying to tell them. The end is coming. Listen. I can't tell you the conversations that I've been having over the last couple of weeks. We talk to people and you're like, do you realize that we are at the point in Scripture where God says He is ready to return? Oh yeah. Well, I feel it. I know it's coming. Really? What? So, how does that affect your life? I don't know. Okay, I guess. I'm good. You hear this a lot too. Only God can judge me. Be careful because He's going to. See, the thing is, people know it's coming. We, we all feel, we all have that the, the, the Spirit has moved through this building. He has touched every single one of our hearts. And He is telling us, it's time. The, the sun's coming. The, the, the dawn's about to break. And we're ready. We are absolutely ready. But then when you talk to other people, oh yeah, yeah, the end's coming. Are you ready? Well, I, I got my kids' thing coming. How, how, how are you ready? Can I get a witness? He can come back on my terms. It don't work that way. Because listen, if it wasn't her kids, it would be somebody else's, right? Yeah. He's going to come back and he's going to come back. Period. It's on his schedule, not our schedule. Yes. Nobody wants to die. Amen. Now, this is a direct refusal to believe God's word and live according to it. Even when you are presented with biblical truth. I can't tell you how many times you guys have had the same experience when you literally give people the truth of God's word and they see it and they're like, huh, prize? Yeah, that's a gift. How is that the same? It's not the same. Yeah, it's the same. God wants to give us everything all the time. What? Yes, the prize is the same thing. Thank you. The same thing, though, basically, a reward is what you earn. That's right. It's when you earn that you get it. Can I get it? You basically don't have to work for it. You just get it. You want to know? I'm good. <laughs> I mean, because he's on it. See, this is why we speak at Holy at, at Lighthouse Church. Because the Holy Spirit works through people. All right, now let's look at God's other people, the Israelites. <laughs> Verse 6 through 8. Now, God is literally going to put his finger on them. For three transgressions of Israel, and for four, I will not provoke its punishment. Now, remember what three, four, four means. It means they've gone overboard. Because they sell the righteous for money and the needy for a pair of sandals. The name Israel literally means God prevails. It literally means God prevails. When you look at Scripture, watch the reproach. 
They sell the righteous for money. The who? The who? Hey, let's bring in the people. And then let's just take all the money. Don't think it happens? It does. And the needy for a pair of sandals. These who pant after the very dust of the earth on the head of the helpless. Also, oh wait, he's not done yet. Turn aside the way of the humble, and a man and his father resort to the same girl in order to profane my holy name. How? Verse 8, and on garments taken as pledges, they stretch out beside the altar. That's a picture of sexual intercourse. And in the house of their God, they drink the wine of those who have been fine. This is immorality to the nth degree. What is their reproach? Greed and lust. These are God's people. Surely God's people wouldn't be greedy. Surely God's people wouldn't be lustful. These offenses go without sin. The Israelites turn the desires of the flesh to literally satisfy themselves. They turn to the love of money and then what it could bring them. Power, prestige, fame, comfort. The lustful actions of sharing the same woman and having relations on a garment next to an altar were things that the surrounding pagan nations did. To, they did that to please their gods, small g. And then they did this to do this on the Lord's place. It's absolutely despicable. Because that's not what God wanted at all. Now, in verses 9 through 16, God gives Israel a scathing rebuke. And literally what he tells them is, guess what, y'all? Without me, you would have been nowhere. You were in Egypt. And because I remembered the promise, I took you out of there. Because of what I did, I took you out of there. And look how you repay me. So let's put all of this together. Let's just look at the offenses, okay? We're going to take each of the eight offenses and we're going to put them up on the board. Now, as we look at these offenses, offenses, brutality, oppression, imprisonment, vengeance, murder of the innocents, cruelty, defiance, greed, lust, Here's your question. And I want you to raise your hand if it's yes. Do you see these, all of them, do you see all of them at work today? Yes. yes. Especially the who? The government. Oh, the leaders of the people who control? Oh, how interesting is that? Yes. He said it, I didn't. And he's right. They, they'll do the same thing. Okay? Therefore, God is warning us that his judgment is coming upon the earth because of these offenses. Listen to me. He did it back then? Do you seriously think he's not going to do it now? Especially when the word of God says, yeah, I'm coming. Why is he coming back to judge? Why? Because of that. Because of brutality, oppression, imprisonment, vengeance, murder of the... It, listen to me. Abortion is not a small thing for God. Okay? Cruelty, defiance, greed, lust. His patience has reached an end. Now, remember that call that we all feel, that God's coming. Why is He coming? Because He's had enough. He's, he's had enough. It, it's, 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 it's too much. He knew that man would... Do, now, here's the thing that, that, that gets me every time. God knew that man would get to this point. He knew that we would go overboard. But by His grace, He is still letting us breathe. He is still giving us the opportunity to talk to people. He is still giving us the opportunity to talk to the brothers and sisters of Christ and try to explain to them what is fixing to happen. Fix it. It isn't that 
God is somehow fed up with us. We will actually see His true heart in just a minute. It is that the time for justice and righteousness has come according to His plan and His timing. When God think of, when people think about God's judgment, they literally think of, Arr! no. What God is saying is, I want to wipe all that away so that I can have justice and righteousness the way that I originally created it to be. But there is a hidden message to this. Because we're, we're, we see judgments coming. It's clear. And we see why, right? I'm going to put up all of the other descriptions of the, of the nations. We're going to go through them one at a time. You ready? Silent is the sackcloth we have. Knowing that what is about to happen, the people will mourn. Straw. A rock. Red. Tribal. Of his father. Praised, God prevails. Who does that sound like to you? Give me a name of somebody. Jesus. Silent is the sackcloth weaver. Stop there for just a second. I want you to turn to Ezekiel 18 for just a moment. Ezekiel 18, verse 23. Listen, for those people who want to say that God literally takes pleasure in his wrath and he can't wait to come down here and smite everybody, you need to read Ezekiel 18, verse 23. Y'all ready? Okay. Yes. It's a prophet, so it's going to be a little bit before you. Uh, yes, sir. The trumpet is... No, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So far, we love it. Ready? 18, verse 23. So, we're just talking about silent is the sackcloth weaver. How does this connect to Christ? You ready? Do I have any pleasure in the death of the wicked? That's a rhetorical question, and the answer is no declares the Lord God, rather than that they should turn from his that he should turn from his ways and live. God takes no pleasure in having to punish people, to discipline people. He doesn't. Silent is the sackcloth weaver. It's a picture of Christ. Who is strong? Jesus Almighty. Who is the rock? Who is going to be coming red with vengeance, with anger? Christ, because he has to judge. Now remember, he's not judging just to be angry. He's doing this because he wants righteousness and justice. That's what he originally created us for. And unfortunately, he has to deal with these things. You see it? Tribal. What tribe was he from? The tribe of Judah. Is he of his father? Is he praised? Yes. Is he God who prevails? Yes. You're seeing a picture of Christ. So what is God saying? I'm going to start, and I'm going to have. I, I will judge the nations. My son's going to do it. Is that anywhere in Scripture? Psalm two, if you don't believe it. This is a picture of Jesus. Here's the hidden message. God's literally trying to tell you who's going to be the one. Now, this is what I want to end up with. Judgment is coming. Okay? Now listen. Many times when we hear that, dare I say sometimes we can get prideful? Okay? Judgment is coming. You better straighten up your life. But that's not the heart of God at all. Okay? Now I want you to understand what he's saying here. This is the word that the Lord has for us. Okay? Yes, judgment is coming. But don't you dare revel in it. 
you need to mourn. Do we understand truly what is going to happen? Listen to me. Not just at the great white throne judgment for the unbeliever, okay? For our brothers and sisters in Christ. Well, what can I do? You can pray. The prayer of a righteous man availeth much. We, we have not because we ask not. Y'all, we just about a month ago, we all sat in here and we all prayed and we said, God, bring our brother back. Bring our brother back. Bring our, and what did he do? He brought our brother back. We asked. He answered. It's over. Turn to Proverbs 24. Proverbs 24, verse 17. Now I know when we, we read this verse, we sometimes think of people as they're living their lives and, you know, the wicked man gets caught and he goes to jail and we're all like, you yeah, know, oh, don't, don't do this. But listen to me. We have to understand that the Word of God is eternal and it has more than just one meaning for us. Okay? Watch what it says in verse 17. Everybody ready? Do not rejoice when your enemy falls. And do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles. Lest the Lord see it and be displeased. Listen. We know of people in our lives that are not living the way that they're supposed to, right? Now listen to me. It's not how you want them to live. It's how God wants them to live. It's a completely different scenario. Okay? Every single one of us are on our own path. And God is literally saying, look, judgment is coming, but don't get all excited about it. Why? Because guess what you have to do? It's coming for you too. And if we're prideful and arrogant and think, whew, I've been so good, God will literally show you ways and say, oh no, son, you really weren't. And for these offenses alone, I can discipline you. What are we seeing? And these verses, if you want, go ahead and write them down. We're not going to touch on each and every one of them, except for Proverbs 17.5. 17.5. Here is the promise of God. Does everybody understand what a promise is? A promise means if God says it, it's going to come to pass. Right? Verse 5. He who mocks the poor reproaches his maker. He who rejoices at calamity will not go unpunished. Do not revel in the fact that judgment is coming. What are we saying? What are we seeing here? judgment of God upon the nations upon the body of Christ upon the earth we are to be just like Ezekiel 18.23 take no joy because listen it could be you Father, we thank you for your word. It is a strong word, but it is your word nonetheless. Many times, Father, I'll confess that when we see the coming judgment, we think, finally, such and such is going to get theirs. But you take no delight in having to do that. You take no delight in having to punish your own 
You take no delight in handing out the sentence that the unsaved have decided they don't want you. You take no delight in that. That doesn't make you joyful, gleeful. It breaks your heart. And Father, for the times that we may have thought that way right now, in the name of Jesus, we rebuke that. We ask for your heart. Your heart to meet the needs of people where they are. To show them the love of Ezekiel 18, 23. That you would have them turn to you. That you would have us be a vessel for you. Lord God, we desperately need you to do the undoable. We need miracle after miracle after miracle because we know that the sun is coming up over the horizon soon. We know that the time is short. Put in us, Father, a holy fire of zeal to speak your word boldly with love and compassion and mercy to have your heart that says, I would not wish that any should perish. I wish that all would be saved and come to the epinosis of, of God's Word. Do the work that only you can do, Lord. We are willing. We know you don't want our want to. You want our willingness. This morning we're willing. Right here, right now, we're willing. Lead us to the places. Bring us to the people. Start the conversations. Do what only you can do. And we thank you for all of these that will come to us by the authority of your promise. Go on speaking, but don't be silent. The end is near. And it's in Jesus Christ's glorious name that I pray. And all of God's children said, Last night, they were running the, uh, the series uh, Left Behind, and um, and this is before I went to bed last night. It was showing the, the the one of the movies that was the tribulation force, and you know these were made in what the early 2000s, late 90s, and I sat there and watched that. I didn't watch the whole thing because I needed to go, go to sleep, but. I, I sat there and I thought, oh my goodness, what we saw back then and thought, wow, can you ever imagine that happening? Can you ever, ever imagine any of this happening? Cars being burned, people fighting each other in the street, riots, all these stuff that all you have to do today is just cut the television set on and you'll see it on there happening. It was unreal how all of that back then people were like, it's happening. It's here. It's, it's now. Happening. It's happening today. Yes. Unreal. 